Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome as you're filing in here to the Zoom room. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 921st New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Rex Butler, Todd Cronin, Penny Florence, Joe Fife, WJT Mitchell, Joseph North, Saul Ostro, and Jeremy Gilbert Rolf. And we are thrilled to welcome poet G.E. Schwartz here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenin Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for a necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Rex Butler is professor of art history in the Faculty of Art Design and Architecture, Monash University, Melbourne. He's the author or, um, and, or editor of 11 books, most recently on Australian art. Todd Cronin is professor of art history at Emory University and editor-in-chief of nonsite.org. His latest book, Nothing Permanent, Modern Architecture in California, appeared in June with University of Minnesota Press. Penny Florence is Professor Emerita at the Slade School of Fine Art, UCL, and an intercross undisciplinary artist and writer. She is a feminist materialist whose skepticism over isms manifests in her theoretical writing and in mixed installations, including digital, printed, and film poetry. Joe Fife, a painter and writer, has shown internationally throughout the last three decades, including three solo exhibitions in Vietnam, where he received Fulbright in 2006. He's working on a biography of John Coplins and teaches graduate fine arts at Pratt Institute. Scholar and theorist of media, visual art, and literature, W.J.T. Mitchell, a senior editor of the interdisciplinary journal Critical Inquiry, a quarterly devoted to critical theory in the arts and human sciences. Mitchell is known especially for his work on the relations of visual and verbal representations in the context of social and political issues. Joseph North is the author of Literary Criticism, A Concise Political History. He is currently at work on two further books. North teaches literature at Yale. Independent curator and critic and co-founder of Critical Practices, Inc., Saul Ostro has organized over 80 exhibitions and his writings have appeared in art magazines, journals, and catalogs in the USA and Europe. And our host today, Jeremy Gilbert Rolf, Professor and Chair Emeritus at Art Center College of Design, is a painter who also writes about art. He has been exhibiting since 1970 and is the author of four books and numerous essays. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And I will turn things over to Jeremy. Thank you. Um, OK, I think um, we only have an hour, so we should be get started. Um, I was asked to uh, do the critics page and uh, Fong Bui told me I could invite 12 people to write about anything they liked and so I did and um, uh, my own feeling is that uh, as I said in my in introduction in the rail that the idea of always doing anything is difficult when you when you, when it's associated with art and so maybe the, the question needs to be modulated. But in any case, we'll let other people get going. And obviously, I'll interrupt as we go along. I have, I'm going to suggest three people, beginners. Um, uh, Joseph North, because when I read the review of Joseph's book in, in uh, New Left Review, uh, Kunkel, who reviewed it, said that Joseph had drawn uh, attention to the question that the historicization was not necessarily left wing, and I think that's a good place to begin. I think I'd ask Tom Mitchell to respond to whatever he says, because Tom got very grumpy when we brought up this question, and um, I think that could be could have something get us going. And then the third person would be uh, Todd Cronin, because Todd I think disagrees with both of them, and also for good measure. Uh, with Don Mi Choi, and so that's fairly fairly good going, sort of hat trick. 
And then when those three have spoken, either jump in or I'll, I'll suggest someone if no one jumps in. But let's go. Where, where's, where's, uh, where is, uh, there he is. Okay. Here I am. Yeah, let's go. Yep. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks to the organizers. Um, I'm a bit uh, wary now of uh, uh, annoying the grumpy WJT Mitchell, but <laughs> but I'll see how I go. Um, yeah, I don't think that historicizing has any necessary politics in our modern world. Oh, can you hear me okay? I'm looking yeah. blank looks. Okay, great. Yeah, I don't think that it has any necessary politics, although instantly as soon as one says that, one has to qualify what, one's mean, what one means by historicizing because... It's so often these conversations happen and we all sail past each other like ships in the night because we actually mean different things. Uh, yes, yes, I just sure. want to say one thing very quickly, which is that, um, uh, let me say two two kind of meanings. One, which is, I think, quite deep and sophisticated and another, which I think is more common and in some ways better to focus on in a conversation like this. The de If we really want to think about the deeper meanings of historicizing, at least on the left, I think we're really in an argument about the philosophy of history, we often head in the direction of talking about Hegel, and we might even end up in, for those of us on the left, in the sort of, you know, to follow the Jameson quote, um, in quite a heady debate about the sort of high arcana of Marxist value theory. Uh, at that level, I am totally in favor of historicizing. Um, but, uh, and at that level, it has a politics. It's the politics of the radical Marxist left, if you like. But I don't actually think that that's the level at which we usually mean historicizing. And I think if we're too quick to jump to that level, uh, we're missing what's actually going on with most of the appeals to historicizing today. Um, so let me try and w talk at a more um, sort of uh, understandable level uh, or accessible level down to earth. I recall at graduate school about 10 years ago, there were many wrong answers, I felt, but I think many of us quickly learned that there was one answer that was always right, which was this needs to be historicized. If you just said that in the classroom, you oh, there was like nods and everyone, yeah, that was always going to be true in some form. The question is, well, why, what did that mean at that point? It did not mean we have to have a sophisticated commitment to a sort of Marxist conception of history. Um, it usually meant something more like we should write cultural history rather than say, do theory or do, um, uh, sociology of the of the artworks or, you know, any of the other things we might have been doing, or certainly evaluative criticism. But maybe in its more political vein, it usually meant something like the person that we are critiquing has assumed that something is universal or essential, true for all times and places, and we are going to point out that, in fact, this this truth is contingent, relative, and belongs to its specific time and place. Now, that move, which is effectively a critique of essentialism or universalism, sometimes has a left-wing valence and sometimes does not in its practical operation. Uh, and that, that I think, is my larger point about the, the stakes of historicizing. I think that in the moment when um, Jameson said the slogan, we're really responding. He's partly talking about this deeper level, uh, which is a sort of a historical materialist critique of idealism. But he's also just responding to a situation, a cultural situation in the mid-century when a whole bunch of people on the in the center and on the right are saying, ah, you radicals, you know, you have no respect for, um, uh, you, you know, the importance of settled, essential, universal human truths, such as are represented by art. You're all relativist. Why you got to be historicizing everything? And in that context, it seems to me it's totally right. For someone on the left to say no stuff you're universalizing we historicize this is what we do you know but today i think the situation is very different and this is the last thing i'll say just to give one very uh, quick example we've just lived through the radical decade of 2010 to 2020 2020 or so um at the cultural level the left-wing movements of that decade from occupy wall street all the way up through the whole series on black lives matter you know um uh, me too all, all the way through um have insisted on judging past figures. And that's been really central to the project. Um, and in response, the center and center right have shouted, and even the center left have shouted, ah, oh, you radicals, you have no respect for historical difference. Uh, you have no respect for the fact that different times and places have different standards and values, and you're judging historical figures by your own current standards. You're just presentist. You, you, you need to historicize more, you know? And in that context, the left-wing response shouldn't be, let's all historicize. That, that's exactly what the other side are saying, as it were, the other sides, if you like. 
the the answer ought to be no stuff your historical relativism we are willing to judge and your absolute unwillingness to judge the past about which you sort of profess to such grand principles um is actually just an un, uh, an absolute unwillingness to judge the present in disguise so that seems to me a more left wing claim at this point now none of that touches the more fundamental point about um for a marxist a historical materialist approach is a deeply historicist one, but it does change the context in which we make that argument in pretty important ways. Enough for me. Hey, so yeah, well, <laughs> that's uh, enough for our whole hour to discuss. I think that's a fantastic opening, Joseph, and um, so many ideas. Um, first, I want to, I, yeah, I, I'll plead guilty to grumpiness um, it, it, because I thought it was a little bit unfair, Jeremy, to uh, leap on the word always, uh, particularly since, as I argued, when Jameson said that, um, he, he was uh, he was basically anachronizing. He was going against the grain of the moment, I think, when, in uh, urging us to historicize. And for me, I, I'm actually a universalist. I think of myself on the left, but um, th th that doesn't make me automatically uh, a historicist. I don't know what that is exactly. Um, in fact, I've often been accused by my colleagues of being insufficiently historical. Uh, I, I roam around. Uh, I don't have a period uh, that I can claim authority over. Um, so... There, I do think of myself as a dialectical thinker. That is, I like to argue. So immediately I said, no, no, you got Jameson wrong. Uh, but it, I was, uh, if you'll forgive me, it's not just grumpiness. It's also a kind of habitual dialectical way of thinking that uh, I think it's much more fun to challenge each other uh, than to, to nod and say, oh, yes, well, I'll always historicize. Now, the reason I want to always historicize is because it enables two other things that I value very much. One is anachronism and uh, the idea that something doesn't fit in its time. Without historicism, you cannot re resist uh, the tendencies of a time. Uh, you can't get outside them. You can't provide an alternative. So to me, anachronism is not, it's not a, f a failure um, or an error. Uh, or if it is an error, it's the kind of error we make in essays when we try out something, we experiment, we say, uh, let's let's see where this leads us. So that's one thing. It's I think of anachronism as a practice uh, of resistance to, to what everybody is saying, and you know the kind of consensus you feel. And I feel this on the right, on the left, and in the middle, all kinds of cliches. So it's our job to to resist that. The other thing, and this is because we're doing this this week, right now, in the midst of historical events. Yes. We are in the midst of a historical crisis. Another thing that historicism does is it enables and sometimes disables uh, a tendency I would call presentism. I'm sure if we, almost everybody here thinks presentism is a really bad thing. It's uh, it's a kind of ignorance. Uh, you, you you know you don't have any sense of the past or the future. You just live in the present. But there are times when we feel called upon to historicize the present, uh, and I think without historicism, we can't uh, we can't assess the present. We can't look at it both from inside and outside. So uh, I want to urge us, uh, perhaps in some way today, to think about what histori what kind of work does historicism uh, do at this moment? Uh, and it's kind of a question about mood, uh, the, the atmosphere of the times, the sense of events. The, what are the events? What are the possible futures that impinge on the present? Uh, what are the relevant pasts? Uh, of course, if you've been immersed as I have been in teach-ins, uh, in engagements with students for justice in Palestine, in uh, my, my colleagues agonizing over what to say and what not to say, 
we, you know, what do we as intellectuals need to be saying at this moment? It's a very touchy, difficult moment. And uh, we have historical precedents for it, other crises. And history is flooding into this moment. Everybody's got their story. Uh, of, and it's a little bit like that, uh, that great tune in West Side Story when, well, they began it. No, they began it. And we're the ones to stop it once and for all. Tom Friedman had an uh, op-ed piece you know, uh, against once and for all today. The idea that your history enables you to take the moral high ground or the tactical high ground or whatever uh, superiority you want to claim. Uh, so to me, historicism is a live issue. We're being, it's the thing that feeds all sides of debates. Everybody's got their story. Uh, and how do we listen to each other's stories? That's one question I have. How do we entangle those stories? I've been entangled in Israel and Palestine for more than half my life. I uh, went there the first time in 1970. I have many friends on both sides of the Green Line. I'm torn apart at this moment with artists, uh, intellectuals, scholars, journalists on both sides. Um, and we're all trying to grope our way through. Historicism doesn't tell us what to do, but it provide, it's, it's the atmosphere we breathe. It's what we uh, are doing. I know one of you said it's ridiculous to say always historicize since we can't help it. Um, and I'm saying it's sort of like don't forget to breathe. You can't help it. You have to breathe, but don't forget to uh, to take a breath and think about the present. So in addition to my anachronistic argument, I want to push for us to say something today about today, about the present. Hey, Todd. All right. Um, I'll be really brief, and I'm kind of in the middle of a construction zone here. Um, so my my sense and my argument is that there's really there's two options. There's the historicism that you can't help but doing, and then there's presentism, which Tom just described. So historicism, at, which at minimum means that the conditions in which a work was made or something was made play a role in understanding the work. And as I say, this is something we do automatically, whatever our, our feelings about historicism are. The other is presentism, which, as I say, Tom just mentioned, where we use history to make some point in the present. And it's not really about getting history right. Um, and that's fine. Uh, you know, Bertolt Brecht's Galileo is not an accurate account of Galileo. And that's that's perfectly reasonable. So the first uh, thing, historicism in terms of understanding anything in the past is something we automatically do whenever we try and understand something. The other presentism is perfectly reasonable as long as you know that's what you're doing. For me, the mistakes just come in when you purposely confuse the two or even unconsciously confuse the two. That is, you mix the two. I think that's where the error lies. But if you pursue presentism, uh, it's not a kind of get out of jail free card. So whatever your present day concerns are, they're open to evaluation like any other claim made in the present. And really, it has nothing to do with history at all. And that, in my piece, is my second point about Historicism is terrible as a politics. Uh, the point being, the argument there is about the question of reparations, which if we want to get into that in Q and A, we can. Um, that's to say, there's the grievances have nothing to do with if a child is born uh, poor. It doesn't matter what the, their ancestors, what happened to their ancestors. The, the impetus is on us to help them, no matter what their their ancestry was. Um, that's why historicism and politics, I think, is just completely um, mis misguided. Um, so in terms of the kind of uh, presentism issue, um, a lot depends on the nature of the diagnosis. And this comes back to Joseph's piece. And so Joseph kind of lists all these diagnoses and he says, well, we need to, we've, we've been really good at getting the diagnosis right, but we need to, and when, once we do that, how do we move on? Well, I, you know, I completely and fundamentally disagree with the, the picture of the diagnosis. So it's like a laundry list of things, like nine of them are about how people feel about one another kind of anti-discrimination arguments, and then one of them is capitalism. And that's, if you get the diagnosis completely wrong like that, where you can, you know, correct nine of those perfectly reasonably within capitalism. In fact, capitalism is entirely devoted to ameliorating 
and you know discriminatory problems. It has nothing whatsoever to do with capitalism. And in fact, they're used very oftenly as a means to support and embrace capitalism, as in, for instance, universities. So from my perspective, uh, you have to get the diagnosis correct. So if you're going to go beyond historicism into action, which is I totally agree with Joseph, that's what we need to do. Uh, you have to get the diagnosis correct. And, I, and uh, that is the, really the name of the game for me. Do you want to respond to that, Joseph? Um, sure. I don't want to take up too much time because I know other people have things to say. But since you've said sure, um, thanks for referring to that, uh, Todd. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you have to get the diagnosis correct. That seems right. I'm just talking about methodologically. You, you, there's, there's more than diagnosis. You've also got to take action in some form. As far as the question of the diagnosis goes, I think that gets us whether the whether the kind of factors I was listing are implicit in capital or are produced by capital or are somehow ameliorated by capital um, is maybe beyond the question of that we're trying to address here. But I would say that, um, I don't know, it seems to me that, yes, there are certainly elements within capital that militate against certain kinds of like this formal anti-racism, for example, that uh, that, um, uh, you know, is produced by certain phases of capital. But there are also um, forms of racism that are produced by capital. So it's not simple enough to say oh, all of those issues are irrelevant. Capital is this is a, a fight against capital is a um, just, you know, renders the other irrelevant. In fact, it seems to me that a serious account of capital shows that these things are elements within it as well as elements and in, com in complicated ways, elements within it, partly in the way that I think you may be suggesting, but partly also in the sense that capital produces them. But this is a whole nother argument. I don't really want to go down this path because it's distracting us from um, the central question of that we're here to discuss, which is what are the sort of methodological stakes of historicism, the question of whether capitalism implies um, the production of other forms of oppression or the amelioration of other forms of oppression, and when either of those is true seems to me a huge other question. Um, but I take your point that it's an important one. I want to just yeah, I'd like to say something in response can, to can that. I say something I super Jeremy? briefly? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can save it. Yeah. Um, and I, just, I just want to say, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Which one of us is speaking? Um, okay, I will go ahead. Um, I, I think that the, the problem for me with historicism is the position of the dominant. Um, if we have some notion of the past, of what what defines presence, what defines presentness, it's a kind of dominant which is not only um, in terms of um, uh, immediate power, but it's in terms of a lot of subtle other things. It's in terms of um, how you actually approach things, the structure of thinking how you actually um, understand uh, what are the essential elements of that you bring to understanding a concept like historicism. Um, and if could, could you show some of the, the paintings that I wanted to, and, and, and it's, it's, this is one of the things that I wanted to argue, which is that through art, um, you can actually begin to approach some of those other unspoken things, some of those unknowns. Um, the things through through which change occurs, because change does occur, but it, it also gets pulled back. Um, so it's this, it's 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 that kind of. I mean, I've lived long enough now to live through what three or four uh, phases of feminism, um, and to see them be pushed back, to see the wrong elements be taken forward, and very largely because it's not those who understand what the fundamentals of feminism are, whoever get to be in the positions. Uh, and they, often we don't choose to, but to be in the positions where you might be able to participate at the level I'm trying to indicate. So if we have a look at the um, the paintings, where's your pictures? Who's got the Who's got the file? Yep, I I have those. I'll I'll put them up for you. Thank you. A moment. So, um, in the first of the paintings, um, uh, I'll try and keep going until they appear. I'm going to, going to suggest that you look at the central um, white arm. Um, Is it and, these? Yes, the that, that, that one, yes. Just take a look at the arm in the middle. Um, whose is it? Now you don't notice when you first look at this painting that there's any kind of ambiguity there. You just, you see, it, oh, it's, it's her arm. Oh no, it's her, his arm on the right. Um, the two thumbs, um, there's a, a green 
um, vertical in the middle with a thumb. And there's a red thumb if you go down um, towards the right hand side in a diagonal. And those 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 thumbs kind of bracket. Uh, once you start to begin to look at those ambiguities in the painting, an awful lot more um, occur. Could we go to the next painting? I'm trying to be as fast as I can. I hope this is making sense. Um, look at all those hands. Um, whose are they? Um, are those shadows? Are they gloves or are they shadows of the hands? Why are there only four fingers here? Um, why is this figure yellow? Um, and the title of this uh, painting is um, I'm just oh gosh I've forgotten the title. Um, uh, yes, it's a wonderful title. It's it's prostitutes with two cancelled white men, is the title of it. Who's the prostitute? What sex are they? Who are the cancelled white men? What is a cancelled white man? What what does that mean? Um, is that a rat in the top right? right corner there's also in, in other words what the painting does is it makes you ask questions it and it does so at a very fundamental level it shifts structures and that's something that art can do that i think it's very difficult for rational argumentation to do um to the kind of historical um uh what to me anyway historicism implies um looking at the past because People who might approach in a much more concept, complex way like this don't get a chance to be in the dominant. And you you, you actually perceive this. Certainly, this has been the case in Britain um, in the latest political um, events. You see um, the greater radicalism gradually being trimmed down to ensure that through democracy, um, you might get elected. Um, and that means that this 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 tendency to always go back to the dominant um, ten, it moves you away from the, the underlying structures that might enable change, genuine change to occur. And as as uh, people have already said, at this particular moment, it's a, an extremely urgent question: How can we get some genuine change to occur? So I'll pause there and uh, hope that makes sense. I, I just yes, I, I I I think I would like to just say what I was about to say, which was, it, let me trust try to bring up art again, since that's essentially the nominal topic here. But my my objection to uh, Fred Jameson's uh, uh, advice was that um, historicism sometimes helps, sometimes doesn't help. And uh, it, it, there, there's many, many examples of art where the last thing you think about, which doesn't mean you shouldn't think about it, but it could come last, is the historical aspect. But in in my in my introduction to this, I mentioned a couple of German artists, uh, Richter and um, uh, uh, the woman whose name I for always forget, and uh, who makes needlework art. Um, but in both of those cases, I actually find the work much more interesting when I don't think about the the, the question of either Joker Sooth's application to abstract art in 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 the case of Richter or or, or of feminism as such in the way that that it's invoked because in Richter's Richter's work is incredibly interesting because of the complexity of color and surface, which is not touched on by Buclos or any of the or the critics he tries to bring to it. And in the case of um, uh, what is her name anyway, um, the feminism as such is uh, when it comes to the question of of, of uh, sewing on the one hand and painting on the other is this 99 for example and that's the beginning of trying to actually get rid of hierarchies in art between art and crafts so in in both those cases this historicism that's invoked is is basically irrelevant or or, or at best decorative or, or helpful to a dealer and his rich collectors um it doesn't actually go to explaining the work. So that was my feeling about always. That if it's always relevant, 
then it's not always the same thing and it's always and it's sometimes more more relevant than than others in 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 my view so who 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 who's who's got a comment or should we go somewhere I have a painting I could show you that I think I, I might do. bear on, uh, but but you don't have to show it because it's my um, uh, my screensaver. So all I have to do is stop video and show you this image, which is of a painting on a wall in a place. It is called the Wall at Gilo. Hmm. Uh, in the background, uh, you you see a. Uh, a Palestinian village, which has been there for hundreds of years. The point of view is from uh, an Israeli settlement, uh, which, uh, according to the United Nations, is is illegal. The settlers love the view. They don't love the Palestinians who are in the actual view. So they erected a security wall. This is before the big one. And they uh, some recent uh, immigrants from Russia who'd been trained in socialist realism uh, painted a Trump Loy landscape to take the place uh, of the real landscape. Uh, so you could have your your view, but not what comes with it. Uh, I think, and it, it, by the way, this is photographed in this way by uh, an Israeli artist, Mickey Kratzman. All of those factors for me, uh, which are, if you want to call them historical, fine, uh, or contextual, or just relevant to what it is you're looking at, um, to me, they are crucial. This is, uh, and this is certainly a, a prime occasion for art to intervene in the world quite directly. Uh, a young Israeli uh, student asked me uh, to supervise her master's thesis about, uh, and her uh, thesis was about Kratzman and about this series of photographs. Uh, I thought it was quite a brilliant thesis. She pursued uh, the background she, uh, and interviewed the um, uh, both the settlers and the Palestinians, and she interviewed the artists who did it, these uh, recent R Russian immigrants. Their attitude toward the picture, which they painted with considerable skill, was very ambivalent. They said, we needed the money, but we felt there was something about what we were doing that uh, did not make us happy. So to me, that's where art hits the road. Um, let me just stop there. Okay. I think that's very useful. Thank you. Do we want to stay on that theme or do we want to fool around a little bit? I was interested in how um, a number of people, David Reed, who's not here, but Rex, who is, um, were, were going to something kind of tangential to my topic, but... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, nonetheless, uh, should we not to overuse the word relevant to it. Um, and so I, I wonder if um, maybe Rex would like to to join in here and um, raise the question of a you know you've got an artist who's painting in New Zealand. Huh. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, there are sort of um, interesting commonalities, in fact, between lots of the arguments. I mean, if you yeah. think about what W. J. T. Mitchell was just saying. Um, one of his points, I think, is it's in fact only through the attempt or the act of historicization that you can actually see what's anachronistic, that is, what resists being historicized. Um, I mean, equally, I think Robert Pippin was, with, with his you know, discussion of Hegel, was talking about the way that, um, you know, uh, philosophy itself can't be finally historicized, although, as Hegel's saying, everything's historical except the position from which one historicizes. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, Penny was suggesting, and this, this is impossible for sort of um, a universal historicization that change actually occurs. You can't explain that historically, um, finally. Um, and, you know, even, I mean, if you go back to what Joseph was saying, um, 
one also agrees with him um, at, at the limits of our um, moral desire to historicize the past, right? Um, although equally one acknowledges that one has to historicize the past, but finally it can't be the exhaustive moral uh, judgment. You know, we, we are able to judge other people despite the necessity to historicize or contextualize. So in each, each case, um, historicization and what's outside of it or resists it are, are sort of um, implicated in each other, I think. And I think that's the paradox that we've been touching on. Um, and to go back to Jeremy's point, this is the marvellous work by um, a New Zealand artist who's increasingly becoming um, world canonical, a guy called um, 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 Colin McCann. And lots of his work is an allegory of the way that it is open to the future interpretation of its spectator. Um, it um, sees itself as the word of God, in effect, um, and as we all, or the word of Christ. And as we all know, you know, the, the famous enigma is the first apostle Elias has misheard Christ's words, takes them as addressing him rather than the Lord above, and be, and you know, becomes the first uh, proselytizer of Christ. You know, the paradox of Christianity is that it arises from a mishearing, which is marvellous. Mm -hmm. um, and when you see the great victory over death at the National Gave of Australia, it's hung over the spectator's head and you become the witness to cry McCann's death and resurrection to the very extent that right now I'm now proselytizing from McCann to a group of unknowing yet Americans. I mean, I am, in fact, Elias. Um, and I might be getting McCann wrong, that is, historically taking him out of his context, all those sorts of things. But that is how McCann lives on, and that's really how a work of art lives on, by being um, mishistoricized, right? Um, taken out of its context, how else could it possibly live on? Um, and I think that, I know, strikes a lot of chords with Jeremy. Um, uh, you know, and so I think if I could leave it, one must, as much as possible, historicize the artwork but what one finds at the end is it is absolutely unhistoricizable exhaustively. You know, that's the absolute paradox. Um, you'll find that in, you know, the great new Shakespearean Stephen Greenblatt, who reintroduces the, the task of historicizing Shakespeare. But at the end of his book, he'll acknowledge, I have been finally unable to say anything about Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare totally surpasses any historical explanation. Um, you know, the miracle of, well, our word is genius, but let, but again, absolutely the paradox is the two are inseparable, you know, and I think that was WJP Mitchell's point. One only arrives at anachronism through the, the exhaustive effort to historicize. And that's why we keep on talking. We have to, you know, historic, we, we're always contextualizing, we're always historicizing, that's our task as academics, but we'll never get to the end of the task, you know, and thank God for that. If I can paraphrase Colin McCart. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, since you bring it up, I, I, I called everyone who's not going to be here and asked them if they had anything they would like me to say on their behalf. And the one who did was, was uh, Robert Pippin, who, who, who said that it's very important to re to philosophy to to understand one's own sense of historical self understanding, mm, mm, mm. and and yeah. um, I, I just didn't just bring it mm. up because it's such a great thing yeah. to say. But also, this is yeah. needs to be said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, uh, my you know, to be a Hegelian, um, the two things that can't be historicized that are the same are the subject and the object. Right? Uh, you yeah. can't historicize where you're historicizing from, and you can't historicize the object you're historicizing. Everything else can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's the beautiful paradox, I think. And I yeah. think that's why it, there's degrees of of, of 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 the kind of historicizing that one one uses. Um, that there are there are people like Don Michori, whom I mentioned, who lives in history. Her work takes place in history. It's her the history of South Korea. Her, her, her own biography. Her father being a press photographer for the during the Vietnam War, while himself a refugee from Korea. Um, and that's very different from from say Richter's paintings, and and so how how historicization comes in is not the same, and 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 while I understand that, you know, it's unfair to bring up uh, 
read Jameson because he, he wrote that in the 80s. And in the 80s, I was a Callow assistant professor at Princeton and wrote him a letter of congratulation when he wrote Prison House of Language. Pretty soon it got pretty stale and it got pretty stale because it's this idea that historicism is always the same thing, I think. Anyway, there you go. Yeah. Part of the problem for me in terms of this conversation is we keep throwing around this term history and historicism without actually defining those things. Uh, and because, you know, uh, the concern here is given identity politics, things like that, all sorts of things pass for history. Yeah. That's and, and, and become contextual, a means of contextualization. We're not really talking about historicism, we're talking about contextualization. We're talking about positioning things. Uh, and, you know, in the little piece that I wrote, I was concerned with the notion of how, given the end of modern, the supposed end of modernism, the notion of a postmodernist period, that we also end up with the ideas of a post historical period in which. History gets used, fragmented. It's no longer a continuum. It no longer explains anything. It's just used. And history becomes somewhat commodified. So I might ask you all, uh, how do you respond to that? How do, you, how, do, how do we position and contextualize the very notion of historicism rather than just using it or reason? recirculating it. I think we could go back to uh, Joseph Norris, very useful distinction between historicism embedded in uh, a, a long philosophical and political history involving Hegel, Marx, uh, where, and I would call that sublime historicism. It's uh, it, it's deep. It uh, It wants to find the master narrative th that could lead to human emancipation or it, the even more uh, kind of directly relevant today to uh, human survival as a species. Because I do think any historicist of uh, also of the superficial beautiful type who just likes to make contextual remarks and say, hey, this, is, this was the circumstance of this work uh, that uh, we live in a time when uh, extinction narratives, the idea of the end of the line for an entire species has become uh, uh, newly, has become renewed. The nuclear age, which that's that's my birth time, 42, uh, and I lived in Nevada where I witnessed atomic tests. So the idea of the that the human species is just, just guaranteed to go on no, 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 we're extremely dangerous to ourselves and others. And uh, now with climate change and with this latest technical invention we've got, uh, artificial intelligence uh, preceded by social media, we are a danger to ourselves. And so that narrative is, I think, uh, historical at many levels and uh, needs to be taken seriously as a context for whatever we might want to do as artists, scholars, intellectuals, or, or activists. Uh, it's, it's something uh, that, that makes our present quite different from any other present. I think now it's no longer a kind of strange or exotic view to, uh, to reckon with uh, the, the idea that our species future could be very well limited. You know, this, I'll, I'll this, this is if I could have taken a minute there. I'm about to write about someone who was a student of mine 50 years ago, and she's going to have a show. But she told me that she doesn't think the world will survive, and she doesn't think of a future for her work. Therefore, she just does the work, and it's like what it is. But I've never met that before. It's all the reason I bring it up. Is I've never met anyone before who... We didn't require, you know, didn't assume that as long as the word didn't get thrown away, 
that it would be seen for future an indefinite time in the future. And, and, and how to do that, how do you think when you're doing the work is interesting, certainly, but also unimaginable for me. I mean, I don't know if I'd, I'd do, do something all afternoon with this, with a certain knowledge that it wasn't going to rock the world. I mean, how would I do that? Anyway, just bring it up. Yeah. I, I just, um, all this conversation is making me think of um, um, Engels and the World Historic Defeat of Women. Oh, yeah. um, that is a very <laughs> special, particular thing. Um, it is the end of something. Um, and that um, the structures of what happened after that were changed. Um, and I think that very often he's what he's uh, what he says in in that um, essay is is somewhat recuperated um, to a much more regular Marxist um, understanding. And I think Engels was going somewhere else with it. Um, and I think it's useful in in this conversation. It sounds like it. Joe Fife. Is there is there a Anything to add on the you do did you talk about working with the Vietnamese guy, and um, and is that well, like the meeting of two histories? Is that two two historicism? A meeting of a lot of different historicisms. Um, you know, I I knew all summer I was going to have to address this, and uh, when I was in Paris in August, uh, can I have my pictures for a second here? Um, you know, somebody who I've collaborated with before, you know, had the show up. And one of the things about it was it was behind the VinFast showroom. So it was this showroom of Vietnamese made electric cars. Uh, and then behind it, you know, was this this uh, artist that had collaborated with a number of other artists. And there were all these semi, you know, these these ways of evoking contemporary Vietnam that developed out of um, abstract painting, you know, like that, this, this brown painting in the background was assembled from um, the, the lining of um, garments that the Viet Cong used that they didn't, uh, uh, they, they resisted puncture, but not bullets. And there was these dot patterns on them from the the glue that that bound them together, and you know the the whole exhibition was full of all kinds of history. Like um, apparently, one of the first uh, fashion statements after liberation was they used these uh, these same uh, protections to to make handbags. Um, and and the the reason I wanted to write about it, besides the fact there was this this contrast between uh, the evocation of the past 30 years up to the present of what Vietnam was like in various ways, you know, behind the showroom uh, where they were they were projecting this, you know, Viet the the Vietnam of, of the, the consumers present, you know, with these cars. And it was also in relation to the fact that I was aware of the Tuan Andrew Nguyen exhibition at the uh, new museum this summer and the upcoming on melee that's going to be at the at the at moma and i thought you know both of those exhibitions address vietnam in relation to america already you know it's it's stuff that has to do with the american war essentially so there were there were these different modes you know uh and um you know uh, these different modes of historicism. Let's say so. That's that's really what I put together here. Do they contradict one another? This, this oh, I think completely. Yeah, well, but not, well, no. Put it this way: they they certainly are different ways of um, historicizing because you know the show that that uh, my friend put together. You know, he developed out of. Ideas from abstract painting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from BMPT into the world, in a sense, where it seemed to me the the two shows in New York, the one past and the one coming up, are, you know, even though it's 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 a they're mostly photography and film, and we're still dealing with 
uh, you know, narrative in the in the classical sense of narrative with figures, even though it's film and and uh, photography, you know. Um, so I thought that was a big difference. And then the con the context between the the auto show room and this other thing, which by the end of the exhibition, that they weren't even speaking to each other. You know the 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 auto people did, were, didn't didn't know what they were in for with this other room. So ah. it was all pretty interesting. You know, um, they couldn't wait for him to leave and take all his Vietnamese stuff with him. It's not they they didn't even want to associate. Um, uh, so you know there was there there is this uh, um, deliberate uh, uh, presentism in official Vietnam that's you know very strong in relation to what was going on with um, uh, not Min's work and his collaborators. So there is. Just, just to ask the same question in, again, um, there, there, there are Vietnamese people who make, design cars who are looking at the present and the future. And there are Vietnamese artists whose work is based on uh, a response to and development of the past. And um, I, I, two, historic, I, I, two different kinds of more, historic, I, more accurately, I think it's a different present. Okay. Uh, oh, where yeah. not is really, really kind of almost like practicing a kind of flannery where he lives there and, and a lot of the work comes from the street, like that thing in the foreground is from something from a street merchant. So you have these new automobiles, which are turning the street into a very different place. And, um, you know, the streets, the grand uh modernist temple in a way you know everything kind of came from the street uh and um so i think that's still in play there with with his work um, yeah yeah i'm just wondering you know david reed wrote about jack whitten and and he says at the end of his little thing on jack that jack will change the future of new york art or something like that and Jack was there and he's, you know, been there throughout my lifetime and um, about the same age as me. And um, and yet I, I get the feeling that his his attitude to, to abstract art and the abstract art which he's part of is in some ways quite fundamentally different than the one that he attributes to other people. And I just wonder, you know, what whether we, what we think, how we think that, how we actually engage that and that, and uh, that's that is that is the sort of general question i was asking but yeah whatever so oh i don't have a general answer if you're asking me yeah well, i'm just wondering yeah, yeah no okay I think we're nearly over, you know. I don't know. I don't have a clock, but I think well, oh yes, I do. I think we have five or six minutes. Who who is there someone who'd like to wrap it up for us? Is there someone who hasn't spoken and I've lost track of it? Perhaps I should speak for a couple of minutes then. Um, I think it's your turn, Jeremy. You started us off, and now you've got. Yeah, to and I'm wondering, you know, um, I, I think I, I I ask this question, I get very varied answers. There, there's a few other things that could be mentioned, obviously, in terms of when when what is the relationship of the phenomenal object to history when you're actually experiencing it. Um, but but all all I I. I Appreciate and agree with everybody who says, "Well, history is everywhere." I mean, but but again, I, I I leave this meeting with the same thought that I I sort of came into it, although slightly different slightly different terms. Which is, yeah, everything historicism is important, but one of the reasons I brought it up as a sort of annoying question was that indeed it's true 
uh, that people tend to uh, critics, so to say, uh, and artists, and obviously art dealers, but it's understandable with them, um, tend to emphasize the historical dimension over anything like the aesthetic dimension. And the aesthetic, the, I, I know various people here have already discussed this, but the question is that the historicism and the historical identity of something, particularly if you don't explore it as 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 in in as much detail as one would like people to, um, is neat. Whereas the work of art is absolutely not neat. The work of art is uh, something where I I'm just published an essay on Uta Bath, one of my favorite artists, who says that she can't really get going until she's created confusion. So um, the work of art is 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 can be. Obviously, it's propaganda, propagandist work of art, then this isn't true. But if it's a contemplative work of art, then you you get things going, and only later will you be able to explain to yourself or whatever the historical anything you like, the historical meaning, the historical relevance is not the same thing. Um, but only after you've actually managed to find your way to actually produce something, well, there's one of mine. Um, uh, and um, therefore, I, 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 I am left with the thought that I began with. I, I'm persuaded by everybody, um, and I understand the shortcomings of my own thinking, but I'm pressed to insist that there are works which are historically very complex, and obviously so, and there are works that are very historically complex, and it's not so obvious. And there are works where there are too many, to come back to Pippin's remark, um, in the contemporary, where we've folded in the place of historical consciousness into our into our work, um, there are too many works perhaps which invoke history in a very shallow way. And 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 um that isn't either good for the work or obviously for the study of of history. So I hope, hope, hope this has, you know, raised some thought and caused some trouble. And um, with that, I, I, I think we're pretty much at an end, unless there's someone got a valuable thought they can immediately interject and take us to the end. Thanks. Could I say a, a word about my own practice as an artist? Please. Um, the, you know, I uh, and I'm I'm completely unknown, without reputation, with never having had an exhibition. Um, uh, I hope someday I'll have an exhibition of photographs of my work. I, I am a sand call, sandcastle artist. I uh, and it is central to my whole understanding of what history is and art and really everything else uh, because it's a very ephemeral it is the most ephemeral art you can think of it comes and goes it uh, uh, appears and disappears usually within three to four hours uh, it's dependent on the tides completely um, also dependent on the quality of the beach and believe me i've tried um, beaches from australia to uh, south africa to la uh, uh, never been to a beach in china but um as I'm approaching retirement, I'm uh, going to go out and pursue that. So it's an art of time, very time bound, uh, but completely uh, present uh, and cannot, in principle, exist uh, beyond the moment of its making uh, and its unmaking. So that's my confession as the guy who was here defending <laughs> Emerson and getting getting grumpy and so forth. <laughs> This is where my real the the sources of my pleasure lie. Oh. Anybody else? Todd, do you have any further thoughts? In that sense, we're all just making sandcastles that will all disappear in a way. As um, if if climate change is to be believed, it'll it'll all have just been sandcastles. Yeah. Some of them more complex than others, though. Oh, true. And there, there's, I mean, it, it, there's, it's there's, that. I'm sorry, Jeremy. Go ahead. 
No, I said, I'm just saying that's where historicism uh, really resides in, in the question of the complexity of the work and 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 uh, how important but, it is. And of course, we can't really talk about the importance of something if the world's, you know, become a a, a, a mess, a, a dis destroyed itself. You've got, I, I, but I think I it's like... an interesting cleave in that you know it's it it becomes uh, at least for me in, in, in terms of that confession uh, that we have material culture and we have narrative culture and the sandcastle is part of material culture, <laughs> a material history. It a huge metaphor. It's a huge metaphor. It's a, yeah. I think it would be good to um, also just bear in mind the problematics of um, how you get the underrepresented, the non-represented um, into the structures of how we understand history and historicism, not just as um, additions or examples or omissions indeed um but just how we actually alter the structures of the way we approach things that's that seems to me to be the thing i'd like to end on it's mm -hmm. it's how it influences practice yeah yeah yep. There's, there, the, the, the the question you bring up penny is is complicated because of money we can we can we can have um we, we would like to include all the art in the world in our thinking, but it's not going to happen because we haven't got enough non-profit galleries. <laughs> and, um, you know, just to be crude about it, but that's something about it. And, and so good for you, good for the work you do. But just think about it. The um, What do you actually... You Jeremy, do you seriously think I haven't thought about it? Yeah. Um, I mean, the... <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you think about it. I'm just, it, it, it just seems to me it's always this problem that cuts right across. And it's. Yeah, um... but, the, but the money is part of the fundamental structure that I'm talking about, that the issues over money is, it's, 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 it's inherent in that. Yeah. 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 Well, on that slightly gloomy note, were you about to <laughs> And here I thought it was cheery. <laughs> okay. I'm All not right. gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, w I will say this after we've been chatting now for about an hour that I, you know, I, I do, I come back to my initial, you know, point, which is I, I really do think that we are, we have two options here. We have historicism, which has been somehow conflated with a method which mm -hmm. I, I think it's incoherent to imagine what it would be like to approach the world without history. Mm -hmm. um, so historicism, whatever you want to call it, is something we just do. Yes. Um, the, the, the desire to turn it into a method is then when you, you want to evaluate it, usually these days negatively in terms of exhaustion, as Rex put it. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, we can't exhaust works of art. I completely agree with that, but I've never thought that was a concern. Uh, uh, it's it's a kind of a sublime ideal. Then the other one is is the question of presentism, which is also I think a perfectly reasonable approach. The one thing we have not discussed at all is evaluating any of these approaches. So we've ha all had a kind of list of things that are wrong. We've all mentioned things that we think are problems. We haven't actually evaluated whether those are accurate accounts of what the problem is or how it is that we got there. Um, and I realize that that's the part that is that's the dicey part. That's where it gets into actually complicated arguments um, but really what we've had is just a list of things we think are terrible um, which is fine I share I share I share the list um, I'm not sure I've heard of much in the way that, of getting at how it is we got there and that I guess that's my you know I'll, I'll put that out there no and I, I don't think distortions will help that I completely agree I, I myself would suggest that in order to actually discuss and uh, uh, a work, then one ha one has these two parts of it, which are uh, quite difficult. But that that initiated that was my initial problem. That um, 
you, the, the history is is sort of unknown and and i i do discourage people thinking that there's a one i one version of historicism that will work for all things but or be but but the work of art is is not unknown and so we have this this problem of the, the work of art is often hardly described you know there isn't i, I mentioned richter there's no discussion of Richter's paintings. There's no, he's done thousands of fucking paintings. There's no discussion of those paintings. There's no discussion of the difference between Richter's brushwork now and five years ago. It doesn't happen. It takes so long. People don't care in, in, in when they're when they're playing the art game. And so we have this 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 problem where works of art never get explained, never get never get properly examined. And so we're never really in a position where we can say, well, this is how this would work, how historicism could work with this, because this is never actually looked into enough. I'm not saying exhaustive, but looked into enough. Whereas historicism is a method that, that is kind of familiar to us. And, and it's, it's very easy to get into this awful contemporary art thing where we sort of roughly know what kind of work it is. And we're not going to look any further. And we can slot it into the, the historical uh, game uh, without difficulty. And and that that was kind of why I brought up the question, perhaps in a clumsy way. And and I and I agree with you, it's not not been answered here, not been addressed here. But where let us hope someday before the uh, earth the warming of the earth takes over, that we will get there in some way, because it's 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 Quite unsatisfactory, and particularly from the point of view of, I may say so, something like abstract art, you know, where it's. I, um... I, I would just very briefly, I would just say, you know, maybe Jeremy, I, I would say we should leave open the possibility of bad historicism, right? Not to make yeah. it into a method where, which is about exhaustion, but actually there are people that do historicism poorly uh, and yeah. do it well. Um, so that an account of Richter that would be satisfying would be one that would address this, the aesthetic. That'd be um, great. Be I, great. I, be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But instead, with Richter, what you have is uh, uh, Buclo saying he he wants to actually evaluate and think about the work from the point of view of Joe Kasuth, for Christ's sake. People who 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 hate painting, and because they actually make nicer, tidier, um, historical arguments. So we actually we have in in the Richter in the extreme case of Buclo and Richter. We have this example where a very historical argument is made, but it has no visible relationship to the work it's supposed to describe. I think that's that's going a bit far. So, should we come to an end? Okay, I see. I see our moderator nodding. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thank oh. thank you all so so much for this. Um, we have a couple of audience questions. So, um, I our first one is from our managing editor Charlie Schultz. Let's see, Charlie, you can unmute. I think. Yeah, thanks everyone so much for this wonderful conversation. I enjoyed immensely working on the journal, and I I'm very inspired by uh, listening to everyone talk and, and WJT Mitchell, the, uh, the the image you showed of the, the Palestinian artist in the landscape that was um, really moving. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for sharing that. Uh, so a question that I was thinking of uh, while you were speaking, but also um, uh, during the course of working on the issue was, was that as we all no, and there are many different histories in different places. And um, I was thinking about the first 20 years of our current century and how it seems like a time when, um, because of our technologies and our communications, that the different histories of the different places of the planet have really woven in a way that perhaps. Also, this is my naivety, but it seems also that a lot of history is being challenged and in America, rewritten. And so I'm just curious how the transitionary factors or the, the, the slipperiness of, of what history is, how that affects the effort and, and, and call to historicize. 
So what was the question? I understood the question to be about, you know, the different kinds of historicism, and it's something we haven't really touched, but it, it, remember, there is micro history, there is macro, there are, there is social history, there uh, is biography, a form of history. Um, the, uh, and what about memory uh, and the gathering of memory, myth and folklore? the things people recall. And I mean, my family is filled. Every time we talk about the history of my family, we get into an argument uh, because everybody's got their version. So I'm, uh, you, you know, we can't help it. Uh, I, history seems woven into our, into the Dasein. Uh, so I think, we shouldn't think of historicism as just something that is either a method for academics. Uh, there's also, it's there's everyday versions of it. And the object that you're historicizing, I mean, it, it could be a technology, could be a medium, uh, it could be a language. How did Latin go dead and then survive? And we, why did I learn it as a an altar boy? Uh, it, there was a history that led to that, um, and there was my own peculiar choices. I learned Latin because I wanted to be on the St. Saint, Saint Teresa's Little League baseball team. Um, so history is is bunk. Uh, <laughs> I, th I, th I think it was uh, Henry Ford who said that. Uh, and Richard Rorty, the American pragmatist philosopher, um it said it's just one damn thing after another um total rejection of the hegelian notion that there's a you know there is a logic out there so yeah we we've had, have barely scratched the topic haven't we but we i think we've made it itch a little more better that's a, that's a, um, well, we only had an hour but, we were hardly going to fix it in an hour <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd love to say a word to Charlie's question, if I could. Um, uh, do we have time for that? I don't want to... Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I thought that was a great question because, um, yeah, the, the fact that histories mean so many different things to so many different people uh, and so many different things to different people in different moments uh, is really crucial and means that it's hard just to say, well, we always historicize. It's like, well, that's true. Like as Todd Cronin says, it's true that we all oh, can't exist without, in some very broad sense, existing in relation to history. But it sort of doesn't really scratch the surface of the really complex question, right? It seems to me that um, the big one of the big questions that um need to be addressed here is that historicizing, in the sense that many of us, I think, in criticism in various forms, have used it since the seventies and eighties, is really at root a critique of theories of aesthetic autonomy. Um, yeah. Yes. And exactly. and that that is really um, that I think had importantly a really uh, the politics of it, if that which is what I'm particularly interested in, not just being true to the artwork, but also being true to the politics. Both both are important. Um, the um, the politics of that were genuinely left wing for a long time. Um, but and I also think that we ought to hang on to the critique of aesthetic autonomy. That there is a there is a strong tendency sometimes for people who are maybe feeling feelings a little bit like the ones Jeremy's described, which are like, hang on, now we're just talking about history. When do we actually talk about the formal properties of the work, yeah. which seems like a legitimate complaint about many forms of historicism, then sometimes the temptation is to go, well, we need to return to an older model of aesthetic autonomy. And that seems to me a, a real mistake. Not many people make it explicitly, but sometimes it's sort of smuggled in the back door. And the reason I'm saying this in response to Charlie's question is that the question then that I think many of us face and have different answers to is the question of how to um, think seriously about history without returning to an older model of aesthetic autonomy, and therefore how to find a new way of thinking about what we might call the specificity of the artwork without returning to a like large claims about its like fundamental autonomy um, from political and historical concerns. And that, this is really my answer to Charlie, Th that question, I think, becomes particularly interesting when you realize that 
different forms of artwork. It's not just that the artwork in general has a form of specificity that is special to the artwork. It's that different histories produce different forms of specificity that are then called art. Yeah. So that the even the form of specificity that art takes is historicizable in a way. <laughs> Um, and then it becomes really interesting because different things count. And in a way, to, to say that in a, a simpler way, just different things count as art in different contexts. And this is a problem that one instantly confronts. It sounds like a very hairy, heady problem, but it's a problem that one instantly confronts as soon as one tries to do any practical art or literary criticism. You go, okay, well, why does this count as art according to whose criterion and so on? Anyway, that was just some thoughts inspired by Charlie's question. I, I, no, well, I thoroughly agree with that. I thoroughly agree with that. I, I my. Uh perfectly agree with it but i also i think you put your finger on on what the issue is which is yeah. the um history is with us all the time it's replaced god but it's therefore in it's involved in the work of art it's meshed into the work of art or the work of art into it we, we begin to make a serious mistake when we try to separate them mm. but in but the separation is, of course, tempting but to critics because history is quite simple to write about and the work of art isn't. And then, and then there are works, there are people whose work is so imbricated with history. Don Mi Choi is the example that I have on display here. Um, that, that's, that, in, that, that also requires a, a very elaborate kind of analysis and then at the other hand, there are people who make works uh, where you're inclined not to think about history until afterwards or something like that, and and where, therefore, there is a kind of separation. So I think you're absolutely right. I don't think we need old-fashioned... And, and I'm, actually don't, I'm not actually sure that Kant believed in autonomy in the way that it's become bowdlerized into by enemies of Kant. Um, but um, the, the, the... And, and friends of Kant, I would say. <laughs> oh, there you <laughs> Maybe go. Maybe especially <laughs> friends of Kant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I just make that point that it's not a, the the real one. One of the real problems with with what we do is is this artificial separation between things which can't be separated. If 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 history is on our mind all the time, how can you separate it from from what else you do? And the question is, what's the nature of the I mean, relationship though, and um, uh, one of the ones that one is bound to think of is obviously it's a mistake to try to make works of art out of historical significance. It, it's a it's a contradiction in terms. So that's my thought. Do we have another question? Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Charlie, for the question. Um, thank you all. Um, so GE is going to ask our, our final question today. Go ahead, GE. Okay. Uh, thank you so very much. Um, thinking about the imposition of, of uh, the desire of the imposition of memory in historicity, can anybody really, really talk about that a bit? Or is that a, that a non-starter? <laughs> well, um, is it? It's got a long history, that relation of memory and history. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, certainly the invention of writing. Uh, uh, was there any history before uh, human beings could uh, create texts, uh, records, and archives? Uh, before that, there was nothing but... Uh, memory and traces and repetition of, of so stories. you just count oral history do you completely no i'm saying uh, that there was history but when we talk about history i think the default notion is uh the the, the history that is grounded in records text and, and writing uh it, so uh this, I think, was Thucydides' uh, view when he said, uh, you know, previous historians before me have not uh, checked the records. They've just repeated the stories they heard. Uh, so oral history was always seen as, you know, not reliable, um, but it's still with us. 
uh, it, it's uh, and it's a part of history that is, there are disciplines for it, uh, folklore, anthropology. Uh, yet that's what you look for is okay. the unwritten history. Is any history reliable? That's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, history, history, so, yes. know, is it, history as or at least as i as i've been taught is an ideological tool therefore unreliable uh but is and gets ends up being embedded into the society and the culture in such a manner as to appear to be neutral mm-hmm Hmm. This is an interesting. This is an irrelevant remark, but um, it's still interesting. You know, you know, I grew up. I'm the same age as Tom, a couple of years younger, but basically the same age as Tom. And I grew up, and people always talk about old wives' tales whenever you'd come up with something or other. But the more history goes into um, detail. It turns out that all, most of those old wives' tales were right. Their idea of cures were, were, were correct. Mm. And so memory of one kind survives the official history of writing because it's actually kept in people's heads. So there, there's a whole complex area here. Well, far beyond well, that. There's that, and then it has to be separated out from the subjective. Of course. I There's think this is... Don't, this say is sort of... because, don't say of course, because these days the subjective is history. Yeah. Or passes itself as history. Yeah. I never know when you... It's, it's like the history, oh, if we come back to Israel, right? I mean, there's there's at least, who's, whose history is, is it the history of? The history of the Palestinian people, obviously, but that's not what you'll get from the Zionists. And um, so there's there are two, two quite equally true versions of history here. And um, they end up, as usual, who's got the bonds, yeah. I might also mention, I mean, one of my favorite aspects of history is actually uh, prehistory. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have disciplines that study the world before. I mean, if history is the history of us, of, uh, of the human species, well, what was there before us? 99.9 to 99% of that history is before us. Uh, we are a tiny, tiny interval in the long history of time. Uh, so this is why I found myself driven to write a book about the the rise of prehistory, because, you know, there was no prehistory before around 1790. Mm -hmm. when Cuvier was, uh, Foucault, I think, really made it clear. Mm -hmm. Cuvier smashed all the cabinets where the history of humanity was stored and brought in fossils and said, mm -hmm. there is a history of life before our lives. And, and not just us in this generation, but us as a species. Uh, it shattered the whole picture of the time of the universe, the history of, of the universe. So, and within 50 years, it, it developed uh, a kind of iconic figure, the dinosaur. It became the figure of uh, of prehistory, but also a, a metaphor for obsolescence, failure, uh, and especially of failed empires, because the mm -hmm. dinosaur was ruled. The, they ruled the earth, as we learned from Jurassic Park, and now they are gone. So, what are we using that history for? So, yes, it's it's just a fabulous topic, Jeremy. I'm so happy that you put it out there for us because it's clear this group could we could go on for hours mm -hmm. we could yes yeah maybe maybe a part two then if if we dare <laughs> some other time but but sure. thank you all um so very much for for this day it's, it's been very stim stimulating um 
And so here at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And I'm so, so thrilled to welcome our friend and our poet laureate of the day, G.E. Schwartz, here to the stage. G.E. Schwartz lives in upstate New York uh, when Renonin lands and is the author of Only Others Are, Thinking in Tongues, Odd Fish, Murmurations, and The Very Light We Reach For. Thank you, G.E., for, for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you all so very, very much for the discussion. I think, I think as poets, I often think uh, I try to write something that speaks to a kind of history. Uh, but then also, um, well, I don't know, uh, maybe reaching out uh, to something that transcends the complexities of history. And, and so keeping with today's theme, I offer this poem to begin with. Poem for entering our last historicity. And it begins with an epigram from Frog and Toad by Arnold Lobel. I sat under a tree and waited. The woods became dark. I was afraid. Then I saw two huge green eyes. It was old dark frog. He was standing near me. Frog, asked Toad, did that really happen? Maybe it did, and maybe it didn't, said Frog. Will we remember when our old night ended and a light wind was on the waters? And we left on a small skiff to spend our last time on the river and how there we at once embraced and rejected our historicity and its efforts, leaving our comfort zone, good anxiety, a companion, if we just let it accompany our thoughts. Otherwise, we were on our own path as we pushed off from youth and lust, leaving the guise of a philosopher, a recluse, and life's unrequited lover to ward distance, just the other side of all the web telescopes sighted when it opened onto ontological arguments with stars as metaphors for all experiences beyond history, beyond existence, and how with life about to end and a light wind upon us, we were afloat on a kind of assisting force as never before, and we wended our ways on our river of swirls and eddied as we neared a sea only old metaphysicians knew. And we sent back goodbye to remembered loved ones, so long a part of us as we aged that our sense of how we felt had no heartache at our having to go. I'm ever grateful that um, and honored that I had this a poem and a, and a few others in the October uh, issue of the Brooklyn Rail, especially as it celebrates its 23 years of being free and such a vital force, voice for all the community. This is credulity. <laughs> we believe in warmth and dryness. That's why migration by flight. We try, we circle for possession far and farther, though that's impossible for globes and we are of the sky. Meteors, nickel-filled, crystals as fragments of solid thrown because of havens being ice and shattering despite some wishes. We wear topaz in our feathers for heat, strewn in our irises like straw. We become a lark's eye wrapped in a wolf's skin. One day we wear no beads of blood, no rubies, and put all time aside, adding up our lucky days, avoiding the rain and the saints of ice, the uneven. We are taken by how nothing is the fault of the our afflicted. The illness is just their bad shadow dragging them down. How others, messengers, Jimmy through the slipstream, folding within our wings when your house dies at light's end without telling us above anything. And one more final one, listening to everything that we've all experienced throughout the last few weeks. Finally, I, 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 
although we we often we always have to offer resistance in the struggle, we also have to replenish our ability to do so. And we need sometimes um, an aura de aria, the hour of air. And so it begins, this grige gleam and slow economy, this singular, smooth, silent sweep, a pearl page turning in a tome of darkness, this dawn, this aura d'aria. Always, it is the inevitable melding we await, liquid lilac and spun aluminum puddings of land and sky. This is why we watch and what we need most, the ephemeral pause at day's first light, the circadian blend of two solitudes and hope breathing pillowed silver through a realm that all too soon becomes too loud, too bright, too choked with velocities. As all too soon milkweed seed blown by the wind will enter by some distant slaughterhouse. The dark theme articulated and all brightness filling in. Thank you so very much for listening. Thank you, GE, so, so much. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you for closing us out today. And thank you to Rex and Todd and Penny and Joe um, and Joe and Tom and Saul and Jeremy um, for this conversation today. And we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program, making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 23 three years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events, like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the Rail, and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for Next Texts, a poetry reading curated by Douglas Piccinini with Nina Polari and Ben Fama. And as is tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you again so much for today. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you reading, great talk, great poetry. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks so much, Jeanine. Thank, Thank, Thank you. So beautiful. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, Jeremy. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.